Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. We don't need no badges. I don't have to show you any stinking badges. I tell you right out, I'm a man who likes talking to a man who likes to talk. You're gonna have to answer to the Coca-Cola company. Hey, Lou. May the force be with you. You are a toy! What is it? The uh, stuff that dreams are made of. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Stuff That Dreams Are Made Of, the corner of the Fanitarium podcast, where we are talking about the American Film Institute Top 100 American Movies. Top uh, 100 American Movies! Thank you. Yeah. I'm Steven Sparky. Park your butt at home. Parker! <laughs> <laughs> Steven, park your butt at home, Parker. I am Jessica, park your butt at home, Parker. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. We're coming to you from Quarantine USA, and it's been... We didn't we didn't record an episode last month because of existential dread, but... Here we are. Here we are now, so... <laughs> here we all are. <laughs> Hopefully. We hope still. we are all still here. Yeah. And carrying on. Um with our butts parked at home so um yeah we we haven't got out well i guess because we've taken a month break we did see a few movies in theaters that we haven't yet discussed on the show which we will but other than that we've been catching up on some home streaming uh stuff and we're gonna go over a couple classics namely charlie chaplin's the gold rush and john avildsen i suddenly forgot how to say his name or Realized I never knew how to say his name. Uh, anyways, Rocky! The Italian Stallion! <laughs> yep. Yep, alright, so. First things first, let's talk about the movies that we did catch up on. Um, let's start with the 2019 list that we're still working on. Now, um, after our last episode, you took a trip to Seattle... And I was home alone, so I got to watch a movie you didn't get to see called High Flying Bird, directed by Steven Soderbergh. Ah. And it was really interesting. It's from the guy who wrote Moonlight, and it's got um, Andre Holland, who is also in Moonlight, as well as like Zazy Beats and Kyle McLaughlin. And it's um, shot like on an iPhone, but it's a really well-written piece, you know. It's like another thing with Moonlight. You can tell the guy is a... Uh, playwright the the writer because he's got a real good taste for good dialogue even when it's talking about something that doesn't normally interest me like sports <laughs> but yeah that is streaming on netflix so check it out sports um, done well and steven spot soderbergh had another netflix movie last year called the laundromat jessica you saw that one with me yes yes i did uh we enjoyed that one yeah um i got a lot of you know i i read a lot of stuff when it came out saying it was like lesser soderbergh but i really did enjoy it i think it you know it takes an interesting look at some ways thing and it it kind of has a similar style to something like uh the the big short but i this one really worked for me more effectively so yeah, Laundromat, also on Netflix. Yeah, I feel like I've heard about nothing but shell corporations since watching this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I probably heard about them all the time before, too, but now I have some jazzy... Uh, illustrations. Illustrations going on. Um, something that we had took from a red box with a free red box code we got was Motherless Brooklyn, Edward Norton's... Uh, movie what did you think of that one i know you have a soft spot for ed norton i think that's what i thought of this movie i just have such i had a soft spot for it i mm -hmm. liked it it was yep 
<laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of flashy and showy, and you got you know a really good stacked supporting cast. Yeah. And it, there you got Willem Dafoe and Michael K. Williams and uh, Gugu and Bathara, and it's like, yeah, it just it just hits all the sweet spots for you. Yeah, I, I was a sucker for this one for sure. It does a good job telling the story. Yep, didn't do very well at the box office, but it's it's not which, bad. Which I don't know. I it, I feel like that is a little bit sad. I feel like there's really no reason for the movie not to do like it. Well, okay. I see it's 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 maybe it's uh, not specialty a specialty cinema. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't got the you know the Iron Man in it, you know. <laughs> yeah. Not flashy. I guess. Uh, it's flashy in a different way. Yes. <laughs> Um, Peter Lou, um, that came out last year and it's on Amazon Prime if you have that. Um, what did you think of Peter Lou? Peter Lou was like devastating. Yes, it's, it's a very meticulous film. I think it really benefits from not having too many recognizable stars. There's like one or two guys who've been in a few other things that you pick out, you but know. But it does, it really feels very... Uh, it's a slow burn but then when it explodes it explodes you know yeah 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 no it just it it does it feels like it could be it, it there's nothing to distract from like the real feeling of it i don't know it, it does feel very historically i don't know it you don't get a lot of movies that really lean into like the old it's kind English of like accent. um it's like, like a docudrama <laughs> or something yeah. like that you know it's not very flashily told mm -hmm. and some of it seems a bit mundane but it is all kind of unraveling to this breaking point mm -hmm. that it showcases very well um we let's see we also have been taking advantage of disney plus Mm -hmm. uh, we've been binging a few comfort things there, but a few of the newer things. We saw the new Lady in the Tramp movie. Which I thought was sweet, and I love that they made Darling, like, an African-American lady, and they brought in some diversity, and they didn't, they weren't apologetic about it, and they weren't flashy about it. It's just, this is what it was. I really liked that about it. That sounds dumb, but no. I was like, go Disney. Yeah, I, I like that too. I think this is my favorite of the live-action remakes, honestly. Like, this one... I don't, I'm not sure what it is about it. It just was sweet. It kind of understood what was charming about the other one. Didn't try to overindulge on it a whole lot, you know. My only complaint was that there was not a live fuzzy little beaver. Because the beaver was my favorite character in the animated series. It was basically beaver from Winnie the Pooh, and it was awesome. Oh, you mean gopher? Gopher. Well, be the beaver in it was basically Gopher from Winnie the Pooh. Same yeah, mm -hmm. I loved it as a kid. Anyway, no, that no. was so vehement. No, <laughs> and that was fine. You know, I understand that would be hard to have a translate actor acting. Uh, with dogs. And they they had a little uh, Easter egg in it there, but I thought the the voice performances. I I liked that it kind of had a theme. I liked that, that they it made was jocks a lady. Mm -hmm. lady. Um, there was a Clancy Brown spotting or for our sister-in-law natalie so mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it was really charming and i liked it um another one we saw was togo the the balto story togo was fabulous i adored adored you know our man uh, he was he was uh he was both a naughty poppy and a very good boy good boys all Good boys. It was so good. Why am I suddenly blanking Willem Dafoe? Mm -hmm. He did such a good job. And he, like, shouts Shakespeare to his dogs. Like, <laughs> like shouts poetry while they're... It's just like a lot of things. While they're poetry. racing along, because, you know... Because it's beautiful. Because it is beautiful, yeah. Um, and that actually, crazy. You're what... just like, those guys were effing heroes. <laughs> yep, they were all good boys. All good boys. Even mm -hmm. the mushroom. Good boys all. Um, we actually saw a lot of movies that were on Hulu as a, a place for movies recently. So 
Um, let's get into some of the ones we caught on there. We saw Prospect. That was one you picked out to watch. I loved it. Guys. What's it about? I loved it. Um, it is uh, The Distant Future, and it's about a young girl um, whose father is kind of like a space prospector. He's got this uh, specialty in dealing with these like rare materials, and uh, they're going down on a dig. And uh, anyway, trouble befalls them. Pedro Pascal is about... And it reminded me of this book that I was reading called, um, well, it's a part of a series called the Murderbot series. I just like investigations into the future. <laughs> like, yeah, it's, it's like it's, a little sci-fi romp. Like I feel like you just don't get. It's a sci-fi romp. You can tell they didn't have a lot of budget, but you know what they did, they used well, and they, and they were telling a familiar kind of story in a new environment and yeah. it's 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 really interesting. I yeah. like that the girl got to be front and center, mm -hmm. and they weren't flashy about it. Yeah. She just um, did a good job. We saw Wild Rose, um, the tale of the, uh, let's see, Glasgow. She's from Scotland, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's a Scottish country western singer who's got big dreams. And her mom is Molly Weasley. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that actress. Yeah, and it, it's it's a really sweet movie with great music. Mm -hmm. Made me cry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's on Hulu as well. Um, Missing Link, the the latest Leica movie. I've I've not had had a Leica movie that I unabashedly love more than anything, which is, I feel sad because I feel like some people do, but, and this one was really fun. I really really liked it. I just didn't really really love it. You know, it's visually pleasing. Yes, yeah, so it's it's very visually nice. You know, it's it's charming. You know, Hugh Jackman and Zach Galifianakis are. Are an adorable odd couple. And Zoe Aldana. Zoe Aldana, yeah. Aldana. Yeah. And uh, Timothy Oliphant is the <laughs> bad guy. Yes, Timothy Oliphant. Um, Hotel Mumbai. That's when we saw it. Uh, devastatingly handsome Patel was in it. <laughs> but it, it, I didn't really enjoy this one. It was it was rather bleak, which I mean. It was a has its thing, its place, but it was very yeah. bleak. I don't know how you could tell that story and not be bleak, just like mm -hmm. as far as how much it's part of the modern landscape of, you know, the cultural the cultural brokenness surrounding. I don't know, the violence that happens nowadays, and mm -hmm. like, yes, it. It, it was. It was so bleak. We think we. I think we picked the wrong time to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> um, justifiably bleak. How's that? It is justifiably <laughs> bleak, but maybe your quarantine isn't the best way to watch this movie. <laughs> um, Even now, one thing that is very appropriate for your quarantine watch: Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Right? It makes it seem... it's The movie itself is very... Did you say static? The fact that it doesn't have a soundtrack? It's quiet. It's it's kind of solitary without being lonely. Mm -hmm. And it's also about camaraderie. It's about camaraderie. It, it, some, I, I saw something that described it as like the... It's the female gaze. Because you know, like, there are very few men, if any, on this island like there's people who take them there and then there's like a couple it's mostly women here on the island and it's like a female society yeah. all you know kind of sticking up for each other and stuff like that yeah. and they come together to make music together at some point and like the it's an interesting choice they have in the soundtrack not to have any uh non-diegetic music so it's very silent and then there's a scene where she's playing some music on a harpsichord and that just makes it stick out then there's a scene where all the women are gathering together and they start singing and doing some sort of stomp thing with, you know, clapping and stuff like that. And it's beautiful. Ye old flash mob. Ye old flash mob. And <laughs> of course, it is a, a really charming tale. And that that's all I got to say. It's, it's, it's very good. Oh, it may will probably be on at least one of our lists at the end of the year. Oh, yeah. If not both. We'll see. There, we like I said, we're gonna have a lot of time to catch up on movies. So, um, now, um, as far as other recent releases, it's been hard not to go to the movie theater. 
However, our, our local art house theater, the Salt Lake Film Society, has been offering a Salt Lake Film Society at Home website, which we will post a link to on our social media page, so that at least, if not just us, but other people can support them as well, where we've been able to rent movies and watch them at home while supporting that theater. And the first one that they showed was this documentary that Jessica had really wanted to see called Fantastic Fungi. <laughs> Uh, narrated by Brie Larson. Yeah, it's narrated by Brie Larson, and it's about um, incredible mushrooms and stuff like that. Or, you know, spores and stuff like that. And I'm not too into mushrooms, and I'm still grossed out by mushrooms, but I'm glad <laughs> we were able to watch it together. But, yeah. Did you have any nice. other strong feelings about it? Um, no, it was it was interesting. I, uh, little romp into uh i think it was almost more about fans of mushrooms than mushrooms <laughs> which was kind of fun there are a lot of fans of mushrooms <laughs> let's see now i'm trying to go through the movies that we haven't talked about on the podcast yet because there are a few that we did get to go see in theaters um birds of prey i don't think we talked about that one which you guys can now rent at home if you so desire Sorry, I was just thinking about uh, Phantom Thread. Oh. All of a sudden, <laughs> based off Phantom Thread. Oh, Vegas. mushrooms, I got you. <laughs> so, right, yeah. Birds we, of Prey. We, we liked Birds of Prey. It's, Speaking it's of a little, the female gaze. Yes, it is a little chaotic. I would say it's almost definitely a, a, a more feminine version of Suicide Squad in both all the great and not-so-great ways. It's a very chaotic movie that I don't think quite gels together, but it does have um, does think, have a lot of its uh, good moments, you know? The feminist aspects are the most successful. Yes. I love the style. The style is unapologetic, and it's... Uh, it's uh, you know what I mean like like the most longing gaze in the whole movie is uh focused on an egg sandwich like <laughs> it's like allowing w the women in the film to be like messy and 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 flashy and like unladylike but also like F yeah, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> and like that was my favorite thing about it. It's it wasn't a perfect film, but I loved its style. I no, yeah. It 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 is a very messy film in all the great and some of the not so great <laughs> ways that it is, but it's gloriously messy. So all the ladies were fabulous. If you're down for that. Um Feeling we, good as hell. <laughs> <laughs> we saw Sonic the Hedgehog. Yep. Also now available to to stream should you desire and it was fine, it's fine you know the the sonic didn't give me nightmares so i guess that's a plus good jim job, carrey team. seemed to be having some fun with it so that's a plus um got to see some adam pally in the background and he's great um yeah it, and you know james it's marsden, james good. marsden ben schwartz wasn't as annoying as he could be wait who was the gal friend again oh that is tika sumter i believe she did a good job Mm hmm yeah it was it was it was fun enough you know it's it it's fun. mostly for it's kids fine. it's fine it's, yeah it's for kids it's mostly for kids <laughs> it's okay we saw fantasy island which is that was a whole thing that was that was a thing it wasn't that great but it was kind of fun in a campy way ish i like michael scene michael pena michael pena mm -hmm. and so uh he's always he didn't get to be his fun typical self but it was still an interesting mm -hmm. uh yeah it, it's not that great of a movie but it's kind of a, a silly romp mm -hmm. so um emma 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 guys like i think you've said we are living in the golden age of jane austen jane adaptations <laughs> getting great things like love and friendship and emma and emma was awesome it was fabulous fabulous yeah, it's got and maybe i don't know if it's mostly just like restrained societies like the utah society that really gleam onto movies like emma but it is kind of oh yeah there if it would if you if you live in like a conservative religious back like you appreciate jane austen on a level that i think like folks from like 
bluer states may never. <laughs> <laughs> like, all I'm not saying slight... that in any bad way or that you can't, but like there is something you can appreciate. <laughs> the, the repressed nature of romance is just, <laughs> the... just really tickles the ivories. <laughs> it does. Well, you know, like, um, oh no, they sat in the wrong pew. The horror. <laughs> <laughs> Who's this bee sitting in my pew? <laughs> no, it's fabulous. I liked um, the blonde Mr. Knightley. Uh, our leading lady was fabulous. She uh, of fame um, from The Witch. Johnny Flynn, who is uh, the the younger brother, half-brother of Jerome Flynn from uh, Game of Thrones. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then, of course, um, you Bill got Knight Bill Knight. Bill Knight is... The cherry on top. This <laughs> he's a cherry on top. I love. I love to. I love to think that after Detective Pikachu, he's just like playing Pokemon Go on his phone in between every set. Brazil is like, let's look. I just caught an ancient Mew. An ancient Mew. I love the way Bill Nye says ancient Mew. <laughs> Fabulous. Because that's his favorite Pokemon. And then, let's see. We saw The Invisible Man, mm -hmm. which Intense. that was the last movie we saw in theaters. And it was, a, I think maybe that made it a little more intense. It was all the dread about. Oh my gosh, right? You were sitting like almost six feet away from our fellow moviegoers. And weren't you like right next to them? I was leaning away. But anyway, we ended up with seats right next to each other. And it was like. We, it's like you're like, oh, this is probably going to be our last theater going experience. Because we were going to go see Portrait of a Lady on Fire at the Salt Lake Film Society, but then they closed it. That night. That <laughs> night, yeah. Uh, granted, this was like March, early, early March. We weren't being too bad. No, yeah, it was, it was early March. And we just, I just wanted one more time. I miss the theater, you guys. I <laughs> Like, watching a movie at home just isn't quite the same because... You gotta rewind it several times because you're Your not actually paying attention pee. or stuff like that. Um, oh. No, this movie, speaking of movies about the female gaze, this movie was about the male gaze. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like toxic male gaze. Yes. <laughs> not it's very rough. just the male gaze, the toxic <laughs> masculine. Yeah, it, it didn't quite do what i wanted the movie to do but it was very effective in what it did so yeah it was like it was a lot like um upgrade upgrade but you know what's the one with audrey hepburn where she's blind oh wait until dark this was a very wait until dark type of film mm -hmm. um the leading lady did a really good job um for elizabeth sure. moss yeah it was a good movie about being gaslit Mm -hmm. Then one movie I saw before that, um, without Jessica on my day off, I saw Greed, the newest Michael Winterbottom movie. Mm. And that's another one kind of like um, The Laundromat or The Big Short, where it tackles um, basically the garment industry and really? how it affects... Yeah, it's about some guy who's very Trump-like and his, you know, aggressively, you know materialistic ways and stuff like that. It it's played like, by Steve Coogan. Is it disposable fashion? Yeah, or basically it? it's like uh, discount stores and how they, you know, will like barter and aggressively barter with all these places in Sri Lanka and stuff like that to make, you know, so many pairs of pants for $5 a piece that they sell for $20 and stuff like that. And it's like, I'll give you a four for it, you know, or something like Hello, that. Is this going to ruin Ross? Yeah, it'll probably ruin Ross for you, but <laughs> yeah, it, it was an interesting look at that. Um, also, David Mitchell um, plays like a reporter who's writing the the biopic about or a biography about this guy. So <laughs> that you know, sounds fabulous from Mitchell and Webb. It's also got like Ella Fisher and Asa Butterfield and um, Naomi Aki from the Rise of Skywalker, isn't it too? Oh, so yeah, there's a few familiar British folks in it. And it's charming. Um, and then we saw a few things uh, streaming. We saw another um, one of those uh, Salt Lake Film Society at Home movies with um, Extraordinary, which is this um, Irish horror comedy. 
It was charming. It was charming, yes. I loved it. Uh, the villain is played by Will Forte <laughs> as some one-hit wonder guy trying to make a deal with Satan. <laughs> <laughs> It was, it, no, it was so charming. I just loved it. Mm-hmm. I love the accents. I love, like, the quaint, like, little village life. Yeah, I know her sister, the only downside to, to watching it this way is the sister has a very thick Irish accent and you really can't tell what she's saying. <laughs> you know, it definitely would have benefited from some subtitles. Yeah. <laughs> and then on Disney Plus, the, just a few days ago, they dropped Onward, the new Pixar movie. So we caught up with that one. Mm-hmm. And that was charming. It's not the most charming Pixar movie, but it's not to say it's not good, you know. Even a... Uh... Even lesser Pixar is still Pixar. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> It was fun. I like what it did with like a D and D kind of culture. Like shout out to <laughs> shout know. out to nerds. <laughs> I would watch it again. Yeah, it's it's charming. I uh, you know that's a good cast: Tom Holland and Chris Pratt and Julia Louis Dreyfus and uh, Octavia Spencer as the Manticore and the other folks that pop in and out there. It's a, it's a it's a fun movie. It's got some charm to it. So not not a worse there are worse things you could do. It's it's a good distraction. Yep. So those are all the movies we've seen in the past two months, I guess. Normally we'd seen more, but like I said, existential dread. And we've been catching up on like some older movies that don't really fit our perspective here like we watched the apple dumpling gang movies on disney plus so <laughs> we watched muppet treasure island on disney plus cabin fever <laughs> yep we got cabin fever <laughs> and um we discovered a new streaming service that has existed for a while but it works with my library card apparently it's canopy which uh, if your library is participating in it, you just put in your library card info and you'll get uh, the streaming service. They've got like A24 movies. They've got movies from the Criterion Collection. Mm. So we caught up on a few old classics like uh, The Umbrellas of Cherbourg and The Seventh Seal, which that is was a cut. an appropriate uh, <laughs> quarantine watch. Plague era <laughs> crusaders yeah. and all. Uh, what else do we... Um, Oh, yeah, and we've been catching up on some Shit's Creek, which is also really charming and brings joy to your heart. Mm-hmm. Um, but another um, item that is on Canopy for free, if you have it, is Charlie Chaplin's The Gold Rush. See how I was segueing there into it? Very clever. Very okay. clever. Now, there are actually two versions of The Gold Rush. What we watched was the original... 1925 silent version. Mm-hmm. Um, Fifth highest grossing silent film. Of all time? Of all time. Of, of, of silent film Of era. silent film era. Okay. That, that that doesn't surprise me. Charlie Chaplin was quite a uh, popular bro. Yeah, his he's number, probably got another in the top five, huh? His number one, Birth of a Nation. Possibly. Probably. I'm not going to look into it too much. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. So yes, The Gold Rush is the latest Charlie Chaplin thing. Um, I'd actually seen The Gold Rush before, but I saw the 1942 version, which, which I had uh, rented from the library. And it's actually, like, almost 15 minutes shorter. Yes, yeah. And it has, like, a narration by Charlie Chaplin, and it cuts out a few scenes. I can't remember which scenes it cuts out. but Interestingly, mm-hmm. apparently it, it cuts out the kiss mm-hmm. between the leads at the end, mm-hmm. and it cuts out the subplot of... Um, the ladies' man making Charlie think that uh, the the what's her face is oh that's right he sends her a letter saying that I love you so much and stuff like that which was awkward interesting I mean y- you mm-hmm. had read that uh, Charlie Chaplin had originally cast his wife as the leading lady and she was replaced by who ended up being the leading lady I can't remember her name mm-hmm. uh, I've got up here yes but i I also said it the article i read wasn't clear on which happened first so that's just why it's interesting that was charlie chaplin the one that did the later edits didn't he do the 42 edits um i think i was reading well he did the narration for it and stuff like that so i mean it's interesting that part of it was they sped it up a little bit to match the current frame rate 
But you just wonder what would influence him to change a couple mm-hmm. of those elements. Like, was it regret later in life? <laughs> Who knows? Personal, uh, personal things that I don't know. Just kind of interesting. I thought that was interesting. Mm-hmm. You said that, and then to read that it was. It's also interesting to think about, you know, like, um, we watched this after we saw Togo, and it was interesting because the a lot of the city stuff in the background was the, the same stuff that they had in the background at Togo. It was like they were using the same set almost, but... The Klondike um, kind of gold rush The setting. Klondike gold rush type of setting. Now, the, uh, Togo was set like after all the gold rush stuff had, you know, oh, yeah. pooped out. But it's interesting to think that 1925 wasn't that far off from this time period. And um, it, it's interesting when you watch these silent films how they're actually probably, you know, a lot closer to that time period than we are. Like, I mean, a lot of silent films were about the um, the American Civil War. And if you think about it, it's like, you know, there were Be probably like, still veterans. Yeah, there were probably still veterans around at the time that would remember mm-hmm. the Civil War. I mean, it had only been 40 years, so they would have been, you know, not extremely decrepit. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. What else? So, what what fun set pieces are in the Gold Rush? I think the Gold Rush is one of his funnier movies. There's it's a lot of good... a lot of the classics. There, there's this scene where his... Uh, I guess he, he said he was partly inspired by the Donner Party. But. Yeah, it's got a scene where they're starving in the cabin, and his uh, uh, cabin mate thinks that he looks like a giant turkey leg. No, a chicken. Chicken. And it's got a like a chicken, and he's like chasing him around, and he looks like a chicken, you know. Was that the first time that Yeah, this, month... it's such a classic bit. You're like, was this the first? <laughs> that they did it, where it's like, I'm looking at you, and I'm seeing chicken. <laughs> then there's a the scene where they eat his shoe. Mm-hmm. And the roll dance. The roll dance with the things that he imagines for his lovely little party. And he got poppers for everyone. Oh my gosh, it was precious. Mm-hmm. He got crackers. <laughs> poppers, mm-hmm. crackers. Uh, and there's the Tilting Cabin. I guess that was pretty famous. The Tilting Cabin is pretty famous, yeah. <clears throat> so, the, there's he not... He said, Charlie Chaplin apparently said this was the film he would most like to be remembered for. Apparently. Yes. It's got some... It's a solid, good moment. I suppose. It's it's quite funny. The plot is, you know, it's like most Chaplin movies. It's a bit of a looser plot. It's funny to hear him say that after we were watched something like City Lights, mm-hmm. which seems like it has a lot more of a message. And then for modern Char- times, Chaplin, modern times. That's so, right. We haven't gotten to City Lights yet, <clears throat> but we right. will. Mm-hmm. But but for Chaplin to say he'd like to be remembered for the Gold Rush is kind of interesting when you compare it to some of his weightier commentaries. Yeah. So, it, you know, it's hard to give credence to because Charlie Chaplin is like the man, the legend. Who knows how many fake stories are floating around about Charlie Chaplin? <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, just because he's so. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> as far as the the loose plot, you know, Charlie Chaplin is a prospector who dresses like the tramp, so he definitely isn't dressed for the weather. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's just waddling around. And... City guy. Yep, he's he's just waddling around doing his thing. I'm sure they smell all of them smell terrible, but anyways, um, and he runs into Black Larson and then Big uh, what's his bucket? Big, Joe or... Big Jim, I think. Big Jim, Big Jim. And Black Larson is a criminal on the run, and then Big Jim is just a big prospector who found struck it rich. Struck it rich, but they're all sequestered in this cabin from a storm. And then they send uh, Black Larson out to go find it, and he finds Big Jim's stuff, so he waits to tackle him or something. He gets the jump on him, yeah. Yeah, but then after they they split from the cabin, after they kill a bear and eat it, and their shoes. Um, they, they're, they're all separated. Yeah, they separated, and, and then Big Jim is attacked by Black Larson. Black Larson dies in an avalanche, but then Big Jim loses his memory. <laughs> and can't find his his loot. So he meets back up with Charlie, who's been hanging out in this gold rush town. He's been taking care of this house uh, for some guy in exchange for meals or something like that. And then, um, 
yeah, runs into him, and then Charlie Chaplin strikes it rich on the on a beneficial advance from someone else, kind of like uh, Rocky did. So mm-hmm. that, that's interesting how these these films that you really get are part of the American dream have so much luck, even though they're underdogs. associated with them. You know, they're it's underdogs. So but the only way they succeed is from the generosity of others, you know. Still that stroke. Of... By the way, the gal's name is Georgia Hale. Georgia Hale, Which yeah. is funny because her name in the film is Georgia. <laughs> Georgia. Georgia. Anyways, any other thoughts on The Gold Rush? It's a um, solid no, I... little film. Uh, check it out. <clears throat> Both of them are fun. The, the 42 version has like a fun narration by Charlie Chaplin and stuff like that, but I think it works in either way. So I like I like that you have tied them together. I feel like they do the the Gold Rush and and Rocky and Rocky have mm-hmm. a common thread. I like that. All right, so Jessica, I've got a quiz for you. These are all movies with gold in the title. So you gotta think about movies with gold in the title, and I'll give you hints, and you tell me what the movie is. Okay. All right. Uh, this 1964 movie. Agent 007 uncovers a plot to contaminate the reserve in Fort Knox. Could it be Golden Eye? Is it Gold Eye? Nope. What? Nope. Golden Pussy? Uh. <laughs> Bond film. Hmm. 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 What? Hmm. 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 That's the the Bond theme song from this movie. Oh shoot. Goldfinger. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking of the video, I guess, Goldeneye. <laughs> yep. It it's funny, I accidentally uh wrote down Gold Member, which was the Austin Powers spoof, but it's oh, gold. Goldfinger. Let's see. I didn't write down Gold Member later, nope. But yeah, I put down Gold Member, but it is Goldfinger. So <laughs> All right. In this 1990 <coughs> film, five <laughs> film, Agent 007 attempts to stop a Russian crime syndicate from using a stolen secret space-based weapons program. Gold member? Wait, what? Say that again? This 1995 film, Agent 007 attempts to stop a Russian crime syndicate from using a stolen secret space-based weapons program. I'll give you a hint. You said it earlier. Is that this one is Goldeneye? This one is Goldeneye. Okay, there are two genuine uh, Austin Power films or Austin James Bond James film. Bond films with gold in them. Yep. And who knows? Maybe that's all. Oh. All right, number three in this 2019 film. Um, Isabel Merced stars as a teenager who leads her new school friends on an adventure in the jungle to find her parents, based on a Nickelodeon Junior show. Dora, Lost City of Gold. Yep. (laughs) Alright, in this 2015 film, Helen Mirren plays a Jewish refugee who takes on the Austrian government to recover artwork that rightfully belongs to her family. Lady in Gold? Gold Lady? Uh, Gold Woman? Woman in, woman in gold. Woman in gold. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, you got it there. All I, right. I know what you're talking about. I promise. In this 2007 film, a young girl travels to the far north to save her friend and other children kidnapped by a mysterious organization, based on a book series by Philip Pullman. By Philip Pullman. Mm-hmm. Um. I don't know if I do know this one. Uh, it's got gold in the title. What year was it again? 2007. That helps it won the Oscar for Best Visual Effects. The same book series was recently adopted into a television series. Oh, by... Golden Compass? Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. 1974, Agent 007 is targeted by the world's most expensive hitman. Wait, 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 wait. There are 
more than two 007 films. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, it's all about, I guess, uh, broads and guns and... Uh, I don't know if you ever played the N64 uh, game GoldenEye, but one of the items was a very valuable item that would one-shot KO people. What year was this one? 1974. Roger Moore. Oh, uh... golden pistol <laughs> like, I just... it's called the man with the golden gun okay that is very 70s all right 1981 henry fonda and katherine hepburn play an older couple who agree to take care of their daughter's boyfriend's son for a season henry fonda henry fonda and katherine hepburn this is one I saw, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if you haven't seen it. They both won Oscars for the movie, too. Um. I don't know if I know this one. This is On Golden Pond. Oh, no, I haven't heard of this one. Yep, I, I saw it when I was a kid, or a teenager. Anyways, um, number eight, 1997, Henry Fonda plays a reclusive beekeeper slowly pulling his dysfunctional family together. So both Fondas. Both Fondas. Bees and gold. You can pass if you don't know. I've got to pass on this one, too. This is And this is an answer frequently used in the crosswords, because it's got a large number of vowels in it. Yuli's Gold. Oh, I genuinely have never heard on Golden Pond or Yuli's Gold. Mm-hmm. All yes, right. the Fondas are a blind spot. <laughs> yep. 1986. Eddie Murphy plays a P.I. charged with finding a special child that dark forces want to eliminate. Eddie Murphy. In the 80s. In the 80s. 1986. Jeez, I think the only old Eddie Murphy film I know is like Coming to America. (laughs) I don't know if I know this one. This is The Golden Child. Oh, I should have been able to guess that day. Okay. I feel like if I was just like throwing out. Gold. (laughs) Gold. All right, sorry. The, The last ones maybe are a bit tougher, but. I feel like you might be able to pull them out of the ether there. All right, 1998, uh, a British journalist investigates the career of a 70s glam superstar. This movie starred uh, Christian Bale and Ewan McGregor. This one I know. It's Velvet Goldmine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) All right, not bad, Jess. (laughs) You stumped me a few times. Yeah. Who knew there were three Golden Bond films? (laughs) Yeah, I did those first two, and it's like, oh, those are easy. And then I was researching. It's like, wait, there's another one? (laughs) Golden Eye and Goldfinger, but I didn't know. Yeah, The Man with the Golden Gun. Man with the Golden Gun. It is a very 70s title, isn't it? Mm hmm. The world's most expensive hitman. <laughs> <laughs> is that the tagline? Uh, that's the plot description on IMDb, anyways. Sorry, we're, we're distracted because we found a little beetle and we're following its movements with great anticipation sorry buddy (laughs) anyways um another person who had a golden opportunity was rocky balboa italian stallion the italian stallion yep so was this your first time seeing rocky or had you seen it before no i've seen all the rockies see i've only seen this one and the creed movies i've never seen any other rocky movie oh you're missing out if you've never seen rocky five also i really like the sequel rocky too the second one. I know my coworker really likes Rocky Three with uh, Mr. T clubbing. Yeah, they're all classic. Mm-hmm. It's hard to pick just one. Like I like in the second one, it picks up right after this Rocky, and they're mm-hmm. like in the hospital, and there's shenanigans and. 
Yeah, boxing is a weird sport. And it's like it we're is. gonna I mean, watch all the Rockies have the same plot. Basically. No, yeah. <laughs> Did you ever see Grudge Match? No. Grudge Match is a terrible movie that spits on both the reputation of um, Rocky and Raging Bull, but particularly Raging Bull because Rocky already kind of spit on its own <laughs> uh, <laughs> reputation, but Raging Bull had some. Yeah. Anyways, Rocky. Um, yeah, rewatching is a weird sport. It is a weird sport. It's just two guys. And then they, they just beat the baloney out of each other. Like, yeah. Um, and we're, our, I guess, our bloodlust or something. I don't know. I don't get fighting. <laughs> Actually, no. I get wrestling. Wrestling is kind of glorious. I don't watch wrestling, but I get the appeal. You know? <laughs> There's some uh, theatrics involved. Yeah, it's theatrics. There's a lot of, you know, crap talking on people and stuff like that. You know, everyone's playing a broad character. What? Somebody <laughs> came up with a really great wrestling name, and I can't recall it anymore, but there are some great ones. Um, oh, somebody's like, I'd be the pharmacist, and instead of CVS, it's like DVS. <laughs> DV <laughs> and it'd be like something like, I got your prescription, is there? <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember what their tagline is, but it was hilarious. It was a quarantine inspired. Uh, anyway, um. <laughs> so yeah, Rocky is is kind of interesting to watch it is, in, like, in a vacuum, you know, because it's got like the whole legacy. I was impressed when I was originally watching the Rockies that they have so much heart aside from. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, like it's it's such a, it is it's such a, like a toxic masculine kind of sport you know it's, mm -hmm. it's just, like not i don't mean to say that in like a throwaway kind of, but it's like it's about straight up violence <laughs> but these films he's like such a sweet underdog like he's like walking the neighborhood girl home like because he's worried that she's in with the rough crowd or and then he's uh, like th this movie is it's kind of uh it's gritty, like, you know, you, 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 you go into his apartment and it looks like a total dung heap and stuff like that. It looks it's lived in. He's, you living know. in. he's living in the yeah, slums of Philly. Yeah, he's in the in the slums of Philly. You know, he's eating raw eggs for breakfast. Um, his he's breaking fingers. His clothes are gross. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean Yeah, his, his workout out outfit is gross. He's... He'll He's work he's trying to break fingers for some cut rate loan shark, but he's also uh Look, I'm not emotionally invested. In I'm this. not emotionally invested in this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. He's like uh trying to be a good guy, but he is definitely not your And of course he he is lifted by, from obscurity by Apollo Creed. Who is so fantastic. I, I love Apollo I did not Creed. look out for him, but apparently Michael Dorn is uncredited. You know, Worf from Star Trek as Apollo Creed's bodyguard. <laughs> we, we'll have to look out for him a little more closely. Yeah, we, we, we did a digital rental. That's kind of one of the reasons we are being so late here. We were trying to find a free version to watch so we could recommend it, but doesn't seem to be streaming anywhere for free, so we just cut our losses and spent a few bucks on Amazon to rent it. Still so the man's a premium, apparently. Yep. Um, That's okay. why physical media is not bad, guys. I do have to say, as much as this movie has a heart, it is interesting to watch and be like, geez, none of the women in this movie have much self-determination. <laughs> Except Adrian kind of does. Mm -hmm. Like, the whole character of her brother, like, follows her the whole several films, and he's just... Like, you don't want to, like, completely dislike, because he's, like, got some good in him, but her brother is a real jerk. He, he, and it's... He's kind of a lovable loser in some ways, you know, he's, you know. But then he has but... a real mean streak. Yeah, he's he's got a mean streak, but he's he's kind of just such a loser that you still feel bad for him. Yeah, yeah, you can't completely hate him, because he's, that'd be cruel. And that, that, that's <laughs> part of what comes into it, you know, he, he, he can be cruel, but he's just kind of pathetic as well, you know. Mm-hmm. We'll have to watch more of the Rockies. Yeah, Paul, Paul, yeah, uh, Paul, Burt Young got an Oscar nomination for this. So did um, uh, Burgess Meredith as uh, Mickey. 
There's, I feel like it's got real 70s sensibilities. Kind of like that gritty underside. Yeah. It, interesting characters. Like they're not This was the top grossing movie of that year. You know, it was made for just over a million dollars and it made $225 million. Yeah, it was so. a sleeper hit. Yeah. And it had... Uh, I didn't know that Stallone was so involved in writing and directing these movies. Yeah, he didn't direct this one. It was directed by John Avildsen, but he wrote it. And he directed others. He, yeah, he's directed a lot of other ones, and he really wanted to um, star in it. You know, they they were the the guys really liked the screenplay, but they were thinking it's like, oh, we can get Ryan O'Neill or Robert Redford or Jimmy Kahn for this. And he's like, no, I'm the Italian stallion. I'm gonna play this part. You know. <laughs> and you know he 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 was just as down on his luck as his character at some points. Yeah. He had a rough start. Stallone did. I mean, he didn't. He did porn. <laughs> yeah. And they like they later rebranded it and tried to make a bunch of money off of, of the Italian stallion. Yeah. <laughs> when um, I what is it called? I think one night at McCool's. I don't know. <laughs> uh, kind of funny though. Um, no, and then uh, you know Stallone got an Oscar nomination for both screenwriting and uh, starring, and uh, Talia Shire got one. Yeah, would well, you know he's only one of three men who have gotten the writing and best screenplay and best actor role at the same nomination at the same time? Uh, the others were Orson Welles and Charlie Chaplin, folks. <laughs> Well, I don't think he won, but... But I, I nomination, f- to be nominated for both. I guess he was one of only three. Really? I feel like Woody Allen did that for uh, Annie Hall, maybe. Maybe that... I Yeah, my... Well, you know. I'm not sure. Maybe he didn't my get nominated for... My sources are for, probably... Or, you know, I didn't... Vet it. <laughs> I didn't vet that one. We will we'll follow up on that next month, if we remember. <laughs> but also, it's kind of scary so be easy on us if we forget (laughs) this beetle is still worming its way around um there are a few interesting moments that they kind of improvised just to to make it like apparently the banner was supposed to be correct but then they got it wrong for the movie and so it was like um what are we gonna do about them like oh let's just uh throw in a line where and it just kind of is very fitting it's like actually my my stripes are red with the uh, white stripes instead of that and it's like well and then the guy's like well doesn't matter does it <laughs> nobody cares <Rocky. laughs> let's throw it in the movie <laughs> uh, i love apollo creed's character in this he's hustling he's like getting the mayor's wife's flowers and he knows how to be a showbiz guy like he's so good apparently we should see if we can find a clip apparently Stallone uh, heavily based Apollo Creed's character on Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. And they did a bit at the Oscars with Stallone and Muhammad Ali to show Muhammad Ali was a good sport about Mm -hmm. being kind of caricatured or something. Yeah. So that'd be fun to try to find that clip. But yeah. Uh, Apollo Creed is a good showman. He gets that part of the sport, you know, he's, he get yeah. Yeah. That's why he's, he's popular. You know, it's, I don't know. I guess we'll see if Rocky, how Rocky proceeds in the the time coming, but you know, I guess he did. Did he fight a robot or something like that? No, no, there was just some movie where Polly has a robot. Yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> no, it's just Polly has a robot. I think he like beats it up too, <laughs> <laughs> in classic Polly fashion. Polly. <laughs> Anyways, breaks what... his own robot. Yeah. Um. What else was I gonna say? Oh yeah, Frank Stallone is the one of the street singers in it which is funny because like um later stallone would direct the sequel to saturday night fever staying alive and which includes a theme song which is sung by frank stallone so yeah yeah didn't he use like even his wife and his father like i think his father dings one of the bells or can't remember what it said his wife did i'm I'm sure they involved a lot of the stallone family and this kind of stuff they were all clinger on twos like (laughs) paulie Anyways, they were, um, originally they offered the, the score to David Shire, who was Talia Shire's husband, but he was busy with another project and turned it down. And so they gave it to, to Conti, um, who did the gonna fly now. So classic. Yeah, which is classic. Well, do you know, um, Mm -hmm. I was reading, it is in typical, um, 
typical like this is American media fashion, like the running up the steps in in Philly and like fight like the beating on the big cut of meat. Mm-hmm. Those were based on the antics of a real life boxer. Um, and he was African American, Joe Frazier, uh, according to the Wikipedia page. So, mm-hmm. but it's saying, doesn't uh, Joe Frazier appear in the movie? As he does have a cameo appearance, uh-huh. but he also kind of gets lost of like, those are known as the Rocky steps when uh-huh. the scene was inspired by <laughs> somebody who was actually doing that. And yeah. now it's just known for. That is part guy. of the interesting. It's like very Elvis. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is very Elvis. You know, it, it was also interesting how they, they have the first scene where you see Rocky, Rocky struggling to get up the steps. <laughs> and it's like, that's relatable. And then, of course, later, he's just going up there. Gonna fly now. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. The, and it's interesting that this is the type of movie that would make, you know, $200 million and then spawn eight sequels and stuff like that. Yeah, you know? so ethereal. Yep, it is ethereal. That's, that's capitalism, maybe. <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, that's Rocky. That's the Gold Rush. Any other thoughts before we wrap up today? Um, I was reading. Uh, so the director, I guess his most he had his greatest success with Rocky. Well, yeah, he also did like the Karate Kid and yeah. you know, those kind of sports movies. It's his niche. I was gonna say somebody did. Uh, uh, there was a documentary on his life and career in uh, 2017 uh, called. John G. How did you say his name? I didn't look. You should read it. A Vildson? Mm-hmm. Uh, King of Underdogs. Because it was, or it was like uh, the documentary. It's Rocky, the Karate Kid, and other underdogs. Or, I don't know. Apparently he did good with underdog stories. Yeah. So uh, it's kind of interesting that he didn't necessarily have this like otherwise huge career. Prestige career. You Prestige know, he, career, he had a niche. yeah. He, he did sports movies, kind of like John Horton's. Like, I do westerns. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It'd be interesting to, to learn more mm-hmm. or to watch something like that. So next month, we're going to be tackling some other blockbusters. We've got Jaws mm-hmm. from 1975. And then we have 1946's uh, Alfred Hitchcock classic, North by Northwest. How ironic that we will be sandwiching the quarantine with movies where the stars have died during this pandemic. Yeah. Where some we were of the just, stars. We were just talking er- earlier, and we'll, we'll post some links on our Facebook page, but a couple of the actors who have died in the from this uh, coronavirus was the actress who played Mrs. Kinter, the the mother of the boy who gets eaten on in Jaws. And then last uh, month we covered um, Nashville. Nashville and Alan Garfield, who played... Ronnie Blakely's husband passed away of the coronavirus. So kind of strange well. for mm-hmm. that all to be timed so. Yep. But anyways. Weird, wild stuff. It's a it's a crazy time. Stay safe, guys. Uh, as always, I'm Stephen Sparky Parker. And I'm Jessica Park Your Butt. And stay safe. Stay safe. Stay well. get old don't let us get stupid all right just make us be brave and make us play nice and let us be together tonight Be the
again.